The Torah leaves it up to us. Torah doesn't usually do this, but here they leave it up to us. They tell us that for this yantif, we're to perform a mitzvah. They describe the item, but they don't name the item. They don't define it. They leave it to us. Lekachtem lechem b'yoy merishon pri eitz hoda. Take, take to yourself, onto yourself. Chazal darshan pri eitz hoda. The fruit of a tree, hoda. Beautiful. What a subjective, what a subjective expression. Find a beautiful fruit or a fruit of a beautiful tree. Find it. Which one? So the Gemara says in Masech the Sukkah, we'll help you. Tana Rabbanon, the Chachamun taught, Pri Eitz Hada, Eitz Shatam Eitzoy Upir Yeshava. You want that definition? The definition is a tree in which the taste of the fruit and the taste of the bark are identical. They're the same. Why would that establish? Why would that constitute a beautiful fruit? And which one is it? So the Gemara helps us, and the Gemara tells us that the one fruit that fits that description of Tam, Ha'etz, Vapri, Shava, that's the Esrik. And that's how we know that we use an Esrik, which has become this, one of the two central mitzvahs of the Chaka. The Sukkah, Dalad Minim, and somehow the Esrik, even though, even though the Gavaya Shabaminim, the Gemara calls, the tallest of the species, the one that the Brach is made on is the Lulav, but somehow the Esrig represents something very special as Chazal, the Medrash, the Chsam Soifa, as they describe. Tam ha'etz v'hapri shava. That's a pre eitz hada. Why? What's so beautiful about that? What's so beautiful that the fruit tastes like a bark? What do Chazal mean to tell us? As a child... I heard from my father, Zechon Levracha. He said it on his own. And then I subsequently found it by a number of G'daylam. I found it in the Mefarshim on Yishalmi, the Svasemes. They point to a Rashi in Chumash. The Rashi in Chumash is on a interesting nuance in the Pasuk. Vayoymelekim tache ha'aretz desha the next pasuk, Rashi remarks, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave a command. The command was, and I'm reading Rashi, she hey tam ha eitz kitam ha pri. Vihi loy osasa kain. But she didn't, she didn't oblige. The Adama did not listen to what HaKadosh Baruch Hu had commanded. I know that the question begs, what does it mean the Adama listens or doesn't listen? The Adama is not a Baal Bechira. The Adama has no choice in the matter. That question is an obvious question which the Maral and the Gu'aryeh deals with. But let's go back to the Rashi itself. Sheheitam ha'etz v'hapri shave. That's the mandate, that's the command of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. V'hi lo'i osasokein. The Adama didn't listen. Elo v'toitzei ha'aretz. Rashi brings v'goyma. V'eitz oise pri v'loi ha'etz pri. Not like the 
the earlier Pasuk had commanded. Along with Adam Marishan and his descent, his descent into the abyss that brought man death and all that came with the chet of Adam Marishan, the Adama has also descended. The Adama is also punished accordingly. And the Skalullah. The Maral's explanation is not for right now. It's a very difficult issue. How the Adama, in this case, had a sense of Bechira. But let's talk about the facts. The facts are how Kaddish Baruch Hu wanted every single tree to be tam, uh, every single tree, that fruit producing tree, should be tama, eitz v'apri, shave. And it didn't happen. It didn't happen. And yet the Gemara tells us there is a fruit. There's one fruit that it did happen for. That's the Esrik. Says my father, Zechayin Levracha. And of course now I, I know that uh, he was Mechavan to Gedalim. This is the Hada. The Hada is that this is the fruit that obeyed what HaKadosh Baruch Hu had commanded. It had Tama Eitzvah Prishava. So the beauty that's inherent in the Esrig is that the Esrig listened to HaKadosh Baruch Hu's request, desire, and became what it became. If I could, if I may, I'd like to explain it a drop more the way I hear it. I, I was a bacha, and I was learning the first perik, the first, uh, the first chelik, in the Sefer Derech Hashem. And I was becoming familiar with the concepts of different creations, creations that are ruchniyim and creations, creations that are gashmiyim. And malachim are angels are ruchniyim. And of course, shadim are also ruchniyim. But they are what they are. And so on. I was once walking with my Mishpacha, we consider him an uncle, really a cousin, uh, the great Rosh Hashiva of Chabin, Hagon, Rabbar Shem Shnezen, Chabin Rosh Hashiva, the Baal Bich Hashimin. And I asked him this question. I asked him if the shed is a ruchni, it's a spiritual being, has no guf, has no gashmias, has no body. And the malach has no body and has no gashmis. Why is the malach a malach and the shed a shed? The malach is an angel, it's angelic. It's almost everything about every malach except for those who are malachi chavala, they're destructive malachim, is said in laudable terms, and a shed is considered from the dark side, destructive by definition. Shed has in its, in its root, shoydeid, destructive. That was a question I posed to him. If it's without Gashmias, and Gashmias is what really undoes man, so why aren't they both equal Ruchniyam? And the Rosh Hashiva answered me, the Malach was created to be a Malach. He was created to be a Ruchni without a guf. Not so the shed. The shed was created to be a ruchni attached to a gashmias, but it didn't happen. It didn't happen. For whatever it didn't happen in the Bria means, but it didn't happen. And he said to me in Yiddish, Oib mez geshafen, nisht vimat gemeint, if you're created not the way you were designed, you'll become a mazik. 
you'll become dangerous, injurious, lethal. That's a shed. A malach is exactly as he was designed. May I apply this? I'm thinking, that's exactly the point of the esrig. The esrig was created exactly as it was designed. It's not only that it's fulfilling Hashem's ratzen, but it has a sense of perfection. I am what I'm supposed to be. I'm home always because I'm real. I'm whole. And if I'm whole, W-H-O-L-E, I have a chance of being holy. I have a chance of being holy. I've fulfilled my design, my purpose, my tachlis. The esrig is the perfect fruit. The esrig listened and followed its blueprint. Histakel be'araiso bara alma. Kaddish Baruch looks into the Torah and he created the world. There's a design. And when you fit and follow your design, then you are as you're written in the Torah. But if not... Here's something else. And in the world of beings, you're a shed. And in the world, in the forest, you're just perhaps another tree. But not an esri tree. Not a pre hada. We people, we humans, have to ask ourselves periodically, what was my design? Could I look at my blueprint? Could I see what I was meant to be? And sometimes we're lost and we don't know. We can't find our blueprint. We can't find our design. I think that the mission that our Sameach has fashioned for itself is to help each person find his design to open up a Gemara and a Chumash with every Jewish boy and say to him, I'm going to find you here. I'm going to bring you home. You'll find your design, you'll find your purpose, and you'll find yourself. And you'll be whole again. And you'll be an Esrig in your own life. You'll be the perfect fruit. Sukkis. I think Sukkot is our Sameach Siyantiv. A sukkah is a cocoon. It's a place that's designed only, only for us to be guests in Hashem's abode. And the Esrig tells us, this is who you could be. Tam ha'etz v'apri You'll have the distinctive taste, flavor, aroma of your design. Let us find ourselves on this yantif. And if we can't, let us seek help and say, help me find myself. Help me find my design in the Torah and be what I could be. Let me be my own perfect fruit. A good yantif, cult of. Why do people want to come to Osamech? Why should I be interested in my Judaism? Inside every Jew, however far they become estranged from the beliefs, the traditions, the knowledge of our fathers and our forefathers, there's that little pintalid that goes on glowing and glowing and glowing and never goes out. We want to introduce Jews to something which is their birthright just as much as it is ours. The objective of Osamech is to give someone the fuel to carry them in a dynamic Jewish life for the rest of their lives. We live in a world which is full of uncertainty and insecurity. Osameach aims to give as many people as we can reach out to the opportunity to find something to hold on to. Finally, there were other people who I could talk to and ask the questions that I had been facing for years. I could have Rebeam at my fingertips, who not only could help me literally with what I needed to know, but also could show me what it was like to lead a from life, to have a kosher home, any question can be asked. The most foundational questions are encouraged and discussed. I don't really have a Jewish background, and by don't really, I mean don't have a Jewish background. 
So I was nervous about getting to a yeshiva and opening up a page of Gemara in Hebrew, a language I didn't know. And I'm actually figuring out that even without a background, you can open it up and in time, it works. From complete, complete beginner, novice, all the way through to the most religious black hat wearing like any yeshiva you'd find, and we all coexist under one roof, under the commonality that we're all Jewish. You want to learn? This is the place. You want to grow? This is the place. We start off every morning by saying, Moida Anila Fonecho, Melech Chai Vekayom, Shechazarto Binishmasi, Bechemlo Rabba Munasecha. By starting off, by tar starting our day, by embarking and saying to the Rabbani Shleilam, Thank you so much for our Neshama. We are grateful for having our Neshama. And that is the first thing that we are focused on in regard to our morning. So the step is one in regard to every single day is that we are focused on that we have a Neshama. Every yomtif that we have has a way of describing the time period that we are in. For example, Pesach we refer to as Zman Cheiruseinu. Zman Cheiruseinu because Pesach is a time of our freedom. We move on to Shavuos and we refer to that as Zman Ma'an Cheiruseinu. It is a Zman that we have received the Torah. Both of those are times, each one represented with what we describe the yomtif as, as a Zman Ma'an Cheiruseinu or a Zman Cheiruseinu. And when it comes to the Yamtav of Sukkot, we refer to it as a Zman Simchaseinu. It is a Zman of happiness. It is a Zman that we are able to rejoice. What exactly is that? That Zman Simchaseinu that we have in regard to Sukkot. So we all know that at a point in time we were agricultural people. And people would gather in from the grain, they were gathering their crops, and that in itself would make it a Zman Simchaseinu. But that isn't for everyone. Of course, we are supposed to be happy that everybody has their needs. But there are so many people that wouldn't have grain. There are so many people that didn't have the crops. There are people that were going to walk into a yomtif, and the question becomes, for them, for us, how is it that we have his man Simchaseinu? Rav Dessler, when Rav Dessler is describing the yomtif, and almost to a degree the essence of the yomtif, he takes it as a continuation off of Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is a time where somebody is fasting. We fast. We treat ourselves almost as angelic beings that we are not involved in the physical world by any stretch of the imagination. Until we reach the Yom Tov of Sukkot. And the Yom Tov of Sukkot is a Zman that he refers to as Bittel Hayesh. It's a time of making what we view as the physical as obsolete. We make the yesh as if it is nothing. We are mavatal the yesh. And to that, I think many people would question, how is it that by being mavatal the yesh, by making it as if the physical world is almost insignificant, that we would say that that is something that brings us to a simcha? Because if that is part of the essence of the yomtif, it's to be mavatal the yesh, to remove the physical, then how does that bring us to simcha? How does that bring us to happiness? So I would like to take you to a Pasuk in Tehillim. I would like to take you a Pasuk in Tehillim, a Pasuk that we say regularly. The Pasuk says the following, means to speak about things in the morning in regard to the chesed, that is focused on emuna at night, first the morning, then at night. And Rashi does something fascinating here. And Rashi says, Lahagid Babaikar Chazdecha is Be'ez Hageula. Lahagid Babaikar Chazdecha is at the time of the redemption. Ve'emunascha Ba'leilais is the Ba'oid Tsaras Hagalus, while we are still within the throngs of the Gallus. We are still within the pain of the Gallus. Lahamin Becha, to trust in you, to believe in you, Shetishmor Hafta Chascha, that you are going to watch over your guarantee, Kol Zen I think anybody that would look at this Rashi and the way that he's explaining the Pasuk, we are left with a major question. 
The chronological order is off. If we are first going to focus on Golos, that would make sense. First, focus on the concept that we are in exile. Focus that we are in Golos. And then once we understand that we are in Golos, when we can say Emunas Chabaleilois, then only afterwards should we be saying Lahagid Babayker Chazdecha Be'es HaGeula. So first you would have Golos and then Geula. Why is Rashi setting it up as first Geula and then Golos? To explain that, I would like to give you two contrasting stories. One that I heard from my Rosh Hashiva a number while back. This is what took place with him. He puts out Svarim on a regular basis. I would say almost yearly. Almost yearly he puts out a Sefer. And the funding that comes from the Sefer Svarim are usually from Talmidim. This goes back somewhere around 20 years ago. And there was somebody who was becoming a Talmud, was having a nice relationship with him, and gave him money towards putting out the Sefer. It wasn't long after that he was in America. He came to America, and he decided he's going to stop by this Talmud's house to say a proper thank you. Hakar Zatayv. He shows up by the person's house. I'm not going to say what it is that he saw, but when he said when he walked into the house, he noticed that this person was to a degree living a dual life. He had this in his house that was something that was giving him a different ideology in regard to life. And then he was trying to have a relationship with him. So he turned to this Talmud and he said to him, I know that the reason why you're giving me money in regard to the Svarim is because you're looking for a Rebbe. He says, I learned by Rav Shach. Rav Shach learned by Rav Shach Zalman. And you're looking for a Rebbe. And then you have this other ideology in your home. And this is giving you another approach. It's giving you another direction. I dare say that is also being your Rebbe. I give you 24 hours to make up your mind. Who is going to be your Rebbe? That or me? He responds and he tells me, he says, after 24 hours, he told him, he says, I'll give you 24 hours. 24 hours, make up your mind. He said 24 hours came and went. He didn't hear from him. He took $1,000 cash, the amount of money that had given him towards putting out the safer. He put it into an envelope. He slid it underneath his door and he said goodbye. So, a person makes up their mind they're going to do something. He told me, he said, within 24 hours he got a, tal- a phone call from a Talmud that he had not heard from in over 15 years. Rebbe, please come down to my office. I have something to give you. He comes down to the office. And he gives him a check for $18,000. A check for $18,000. My Rosh Hashiva looks at me and says, David, you see, when you do what you're supposed to do, you get paid back kifl kiflayim. You get paid back much more than what you originally thought you were going to get. That's one story. It's a story that defines for us that sometimes in life we have clarity. And we're looking for clarity. Another story. When we first moved back from Eretz Yisrael, my wife and I and our children, Baruch Hashem, we made our home in South Fallsburg. South Fallsburg nestled up in the country, upstate, beautiful place. It happened to be there was one Matzah Shabbos where my Rebbe, Rav Nachum Broida, was in Muncie, and he was going to be giving a shir slash Malava Malka in somebody's house. I decided that Matzah Shabbos, of course, I'm going to go into my Rebbe to be able to hear the words of Tyra from him. Well, being that we lived upstate, what we did was is that I went into a local Walmart, super center, and they sold these little whistlers that you were able to put onto the, basically on the front bumper of your car. And what these whistlers are supposed to do is they with a shrill sound that we can't hear, but the deer are able to hear it, they would run away from the car. So I made a point, I had those on my Mercury Villager. Left South Fallsburg, exit 107. I got to exit 109, a deer came flying out of the side of the road, smacked into the car. But you know the older cars were built well. It took the hit, 
The deer kept flying, and I kept riding. Came to Muncie. Came to Muncie, went to the shear. On the way back after the shear, I was driving College Road, and a deer comes flying out in front of the car. Baruch Hashem, nothing happened. I continued back up, and at that point in time, I was also a Rebbe in Mountaindale. So while I was a Rebbe in Mountaindale, I was traveling from South Fallsburg to Mountaindale daily. It's about a five to six mile drive. I will tell you over the next two weeks, next day as I was driving to Mountaindale, I hit a deer. Two days later, I drove over a deer. Two days after that, another deer. I'm not exaggerating when I tell you over the next two weeks, seven, eight deer I managed to hit in, hit, in, hit, hit me. I know everybody there is thinking right now that I put the whistlers on the wrong way. That's not what it was. I put the whistlers on the right way. But here it is. And now I am standing by, sitting in the car by what is known as the four corners. I'm by the four corners and I'm looking at the red light and I see out to the left as a, as a deer slowly starts walking towards the car and just smacks into my car. I wasn't even driving. At that moment, I said to myself, what in the world is going on? Baruch Hashem, one of the perks of living in a place like South Fallsburg is that you have a Rosh Hashiva by the name of Ravel Yeber Vacht Flevo. Ravel Yeber, for those of you who don't know him, flowing white beard, his heart, his godless, there's so much to describe. I'm just trying to give you a visual. A flowing white beard, an angelic face, piercing blue eyes. And I went into his office and I said, Rosh Hashiva, I said, this is what's happening. I can't tell you how many deer. What does it mean? And he leans back and he strokes his beard and he says, Dach sich David, it means be careful, there's lots of deer around. At this point, I'm hoping that you're laughing. But I want to tell you that that means that there are times in life where there's clarity and there's times in life where we don't get clarity. But, ultimately, we're looking for clarity. That, I believe, is what Rashi is teaching us. Lahagid ba'beker chazdecha is be'es ha'geula. When you have moments of clarity, when you have moments where you feel that the Rabbani Shalom is in your life, say thank you. Say to the Rabbani Shalom, I notice that this is what's going on and I appreciate it. And you know what happens then? It plants seeds. It plants seeds that take root that you can have emuna, be'emunas chabaleles. So Rashi is not out of chronological order. Rashi is telling us exactly what David HaMelech meant. Lahagid ba'beker chastecha, speak about things be'es hagu'ula. And if you speak about it, and you have moments when you have clarity, then ve'emunas chabaleles, you will have it be'oitzores, shibud ha'golos alecha, she'ta'amid ba'haftachascha. That, I believe, is the pshat in the Rashi. So what we have now is that a person has to have clarity in life. And when a person has clarity in life, that is what we can refer to as an Ace Hagu'ula. Coming towards Sukkot. We're almost there. You know, there's a machlaikas in the Gemara between two manda amrim. We make a Sukkah as a remembrance for the Anani HaKavayid. Is it a zecher for the Anani HaKavid or is it a zecher or is it a remembrance specifically for the little huts that we made? Sukkos Mamish. And in a sequence of questions that the Divrei Yoel that the Satan Rebbe has in his Sefer, numerous questions, he comes up with the following you cite. He has the following foundation in regard to the Yom Tov of Sukkos. And he says, Eilu ve'elu Divrei Elu Kim Chayin. Both of them are speaking the truth. Both of them are right. The Zecher is for the Sukkot Mamish, and the Zecher is there for the Anani HaKavad. But how could you have it that Elu Ve'elu, Divrei Lekim Chaim, which one is it? And in the course of his drasha, he says a vart, he says a thought from the Kedushas Levi. Where the Kedushas Levi is giving over a mushal in regard to how we have a relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. What is that? He says a person receives a coin from the king. Person gets a matbeah. And they get this coin from the king. How do you treat the coin? What do you do with it? It depends, says the Kedushas Levi, 
where you are in stature. Where are you in regard to the relationship with the king? If you are from the peasants, if you are from somebody who may not be connected to the king, the minute you get that coin, you think to yourself, how can I use this to buy what I would like? You look at the coin and you say that this coin is there for me to use. That's the reason why I have the coin. But what about somebody who has a closer relationship with the king? A closer relationship means that when I look at this coin, I see the coin as a remembrance that myself and the king have a relationship. Then you don't use it. You won't use that coin because that coin represents so much more than just the dollar value that's behind it. It represents that there's a kesher between yourself and the king. That is what happens in regard to different things that we receive from the Rabbinic Shalom. Says the Satma Rebbe. He says that is the idea behind Sukkot Mamish or whether it is the Anani HaKovit. We don't have a Yomtif that commemorates the Mun. We don't have a Yomtif that commemorates the Mayan. Why do we have a Yomtif that only commemorates the Sukkot? He says, you want to know why? Because in regard to the Mun, in regard to the Be'er, those are basic necessities. The Rabbi Yishalom had to take care of our basic necessities. Well, if that's the case, we needed something to protect us from the elements as well. And here it is, we're out in the desert, we need something to protect us from the elements. So we needed some sort of housing. We needed some sort of board. What in the world are we going to be living with if we're going to allow the scorpions and the snakes to bite us? That wouldn't be much of an existence, says the Satmarav. He says, you want to know why we have a remembrance specifically for Sukkot Mamish, for Sukkot Anani HaKovid? Either way, because it represented the relationship that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has with us, not because of a necessity. How is it not because of a necessity? Because everybody is in agreement that we had Sukkot Mamish. We had huts. And we had a way of protecting ourselves. And therefore, whether you're remembering because of the actual huts, but that in turn makes you realize that the Anani HaKovid was there because of a relationship, or because of the Anani HaKovid direct relationship, the Yomtif is all about us having a relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Over the Yomtif of Sukkis, we are going to read through Koheles. There's a Rashi in Koheles that for myself was always a very troublesome and bothersome Rashi. I'd like to share it with you. The Pesach says, I praise Simcha. Because there is no good for man under the sun. And the Pesach continues. But Rashi says the following, A person will be happy in his lot, with his lot, and he'll be involved with Pekudim Yesharim Mesam Chelev. And Velo Yehi Shotov Achar Harbis Hoin Beneshech Umarbis Vegezel. And like that, he's not running after these other things, which is the idea of ribbis, taking interest from people or stealing from them. And then Rashi continues and he says, Kol Misha Enesameach Bechelkai. Anybody who is not happy with his lot. Veshotov Achar Hamamain. And he is busy with this inner desire just for more money. Bali de Averis Gezel Ainoa Viribis. He will come to be involved with Gezel, with stealing, Aina, overcharging, or ribis, lending with interest. And if somebody is not happy in regard to his lot as far as his spouse, shot of Achareha Noshim Lahar Achar Ashis Ish. Why? This Rashi to me is troubling. You can't think about things that are mutter. You can't come, we're talking about in a time historically where a person was able to be married to more than one wife. Why not go and marry another wife? It's only lahar achar ish. There's no kosher money that's out there. It's only neshech, it's only neshech, marbis, gezel. It's only the idea of adding on these other things. Why? Until the following insight hit. Everybody has their portion. 
everybody has their chilek. And when a person recognizes that they have their own chilek, you can be happy with your chilek or be unhappy with your chilek. But if you're not happy with your chilek, by definition, you are going to look towards somebody else's chilek. You'll look at somebody else's portion. Because to be part of this world, the Rabbani Shalom gave every last one of us our chilek. He gave us our lot in life. And if you're not happy with your lot in life, the only thing for you to do is look at somebody else's lot in life. And that's what Rashi is teaching us. Sameach Bechelko means be happy with your lot, because if not, the only possibility is you'll be thinking about what other people have. That is an issue. And that is what Rashi is teaching us. So I would like to go back. Zman Simchaseinu. We refer to the Yamtif of Sukkis as Zman Simchaseinu. It's a time of Simcha. People are gathering things in. What are they gathering in? Their chilek. Bringing in your portion. How does one recognize what is my portion, what is my lot in life? And I think that's what Rav Dessler is teaching us. Bittel hayesh. By the removal of all of the physical things in the world, so many of the things that are mundane, that we get so caught up in and invested in, and those things manage to just consume our minds that we think that that is our lot in life, are those items, are the physical aspects of the world. That brings us, unfortunately, at times, to not be samech with our chilek. But when we get back to the root, we get back to the shayrish, of what is our chilek? What is my mitzias? What am I? Who am I? And when I get to that point and I start to understand what my part and what my portion in life is, of course I can add on to that. Of course you can have more, but you got to get back to the root first. You have to get back to that source of understanding. My chilek? My chilek is a kesher with the Rabbani Shlelem. My lot is being connected to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. How amazing it is that the culmination of the entire sukkah is Shmini Atzeres and Simchas Taira. Shmini Atzeres where HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, Kosha alai pridaschem. I don't want you to leave. I want to stay together with you. Just the two of us sitting there and spending time with each other. Reb Chaim Vital. Again, Reb Chaim Vital says from the Ari Kadash, why are the measurements of the sukkah two walls and an amma? Because it's the Rabbani Shleilam giving us a hug. Us spending time in the sukkah is by its very nature zman simchaseinu, because that is our chilek. That is our portion. That is our lot. So I go back to the beginning. Mo'yda'ani lefanecha. Melechai v'kayom. Shechazarta bi nishmasi. You gave me back my neshama, which is a chilek elikam imau. And that is what we feel on Sukkot. The bitl hayesh. The removal of all of the things that are mundane. We enjoy all of it in the presence of the sukkah. In the presence of the shechina. Where we feel our chilek. When we feel our chilek, we feel our lot that gives us clarity into what our goals and our objectives are in life. And ain simcha ka toras hasvekas. Removing all doubts and all questions brings us to genuine joy. My bracha to every last person that is listening to this. And to all of Kla Yisrael, even if you're not listening to this. Everybody should feel their chilek. You should feel completion in your life. You should feel satisfaction. And when you feel that satisfaction, you feel your chilek, feel that connection to the Bayre Eilam, feel that connection that we have a real zman simchaseinu. A zman simchaseinu where it is not only a kesher that we feel the Rabbani Shalom in our sukkah, but that we are zoika, zoika to have the true living with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, with the binyan base Hamigdash from Herov Yamenu. Amen. The 
guys come to here and they say one word, wow. And that's exactly what we wanted. And when you come into the hallway, you see this unbelievable, beautiful building and Batei Midrashim. The beauty of the building, I must say, it took my breath away. I sat there for the first half an hour and I was having difficulty concentrating. Everything here is unique and a piece of art. The architecture is brilliant. The breadth of it, the airiness, it exalts you, brings you up. It gives you a feeling of modern, of space, but yet it retains a certain traditional feel to it. It's modern without being modernistic, a space where you just want to learn. I can't wait to get back into the base medrash. Our student body generally is coming from secular homes, upper middle class to upper class homes. I think that where they come to learn should be at least as beautiful as where they came from. To walk into a building which is the equal or more than any equivalent building anywhere in the world gives the Talmidim a feeling of the importance of what they're doing in there. Outside, the noises are loud, the lights are bright. We need to build an atmosphere which allows a person to feel comfortable despite what they might be used to. The new building has done that and so much more. A lot, the guys in Osamer, a lot of them have made really challenging life decisions to find their way here. These guys are heroes. And if anyone really deserves a nice, pristine, comfortable, spacious building, it's these guys. There's a tremendous dynamic in the yeshiva now, a tremendous feeling of hischadshus, of newness, of, of expansion, of possibility. We hope that Be'ezrat Hashem, this will continue to be a place to connect and we'll have thousands and thousands of students and we'll continue to do the goal of life, Kiddush Hashem. It's a privilege to be here, you know, to see how these guys are growing, how they transform. It's, it's the most exciting place. I, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else.